You have now arrived at your destination. Nick, this is such a joy to do. As I said, I've been a, a long-term frequenter, admirer of many of your establishments for many years. So thank you so much for joining me today, Nick. Well, I'm, I'm really honoured that you asked me on, Harry. Um, Not at all. I've been really looking forward. I've been really looking forward to this one. So I want to start um, with a little bit of an interesting one, which is, you know, how did you make the decision to go into catering? I read that you said it was a shit job at the time when you went in, delicately put. So <laughs> how and why did you make that decision? And then also, what was that first big break for you? Okay, well, the reason why I went into catering is twofold. A, um, my options were small because my exam results were non-existent and I was very <laughs> dyslexic. So all those jobs in the city or in the media were way beyond my um, qualifications allowed me. So, but also catering. This, you're, you're thinking 45 years ago here, Harry. I know you're, I'm, I'm 58 now. And uh, it was a time where certainly in the UK, but I felt, that there was a huge opportunity um, in 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 people being able to eat, drink, and sleep in a slightly different way than what they were able to do at that precise time. And I also always enjoyed, you know, when my parents had people round. I loved seeing a room of people full of people having a really good time. So, you know, there were sort of three reasons why I did it. Can I ask you a weird one? I told you we'd go off topic, but did you did you always know that you'd be successful? I find often there's this innate belief that you will make it. Did you have this? No, I didn't. <laughs> and, uh, I, and, you know, because I was at school and, and, and when you're dyslexic, you, you, you're, you're the bottom of everything. So you, 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 you don't expect success. And I wasn't particularly, I wasn't, I wasn't good at sport. I wasn't, very good at art um yeah I was a sort of below average at everything so I didn't think success was was there for me to grab um and, and it didn't really worry me I, I and I still think even now you know I I do it because I love it and I'm lucky to love the job I do and I people perceive me you know that I've done well but I don't perceive that in myself can I ask, when did it become very obvious that it was working? When was the first signs that, ah, we really have something here and this is a runner? Well, first of all, I did have three restaurants before opening Cafe Burn, which were called Over the Top, and mm -hmm. they didn't work. So I really got to know what it felt like running a business when it didn't work. And actually, it's still the same company. It's still the... the the, the company today is still that same company. So it, it, it never went bust. But I really did learn what it felt like getting it wrong. And How did it feel? I'm sorry, I'm too intrigued. It felt... I didn't feel like a failure. I just felt that I, I have to keep trying, keep rolling the dice until I get it right. And, there's, and I, I think it, it came at a really good time for me because I think if I had set out and the first restaurant I opened was a smash hit and there were queues and people were raving about it. You know, I, 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 I would have never have had that incredibly useful experience of, of running a business which wasn't working. So I sort of look back and I think, yes, it was the right way of it happening. And also learned a lot, learned how, you know, you keep the team motivated when the place is going so badly. You you learn how you pay suppliers when you have very little money. Uh, you learn all sorts of things. And I think I've taken all the things I've learned to not been a success, you know, to 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 where I am now. I, I think the kind of biggest commonality, I've interviewed some of the biggest founders in the world in their success is persistence. It's when it doesn't work, continuously showing up and putting in the work. My question to you is, when it wasn't working, what did you tell yourself in your head that was keeping you showing up, keeping you believing that it one day would work? Well, persistence is, I am persistent, which is quite an annoying, I think, feature of my personality. But I, 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 I knew that people wanted to eat and drink and have a good time. So I just knew that what I was doing at that precise moment wasn't 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 what 
exactly what they wanted. So I kept having to work at what people wanted. And when we opened Café Bohème, or I opened Café Bohème in 1992, I sort of did everything in exact reverse to what Over the Top was. You know, the the, the atmosphere, the decor, the food, the, the service. I, I completely um, swapped it around and changed it around. And thankfully, Café Bohème, which is still thriving in an old Compton Street today, 30 years on, is, is, is worked. I do want to ask, you mentioned that kind of turning it around, doing different things and, and being kind of very different in your approach. When we look at kind of Café Bohème in 1992 to what consumers expect today, how has consumer demands of restaurants, of experience, most changed in your mind when you compare that 92 to today? Well, that's a good question that, because I think in 92 when I opened Café Bohème, it was one of the first places in London which opened at eight o'clock in the morning and closed at 3 a.m. In the, in the following morning. And basically people could come in there and choose what they wanted to do. So it was very chameleon in its, in its, its feel and style. So we didn't mind. I didn't mind people just coming in for a cup of coffee or a jug of beer or coming to listen to the jazz in the afternoon. It, it didn't matter. It, I wasn't obsessed about everyone having to have a knife and fork meal. It was about the atmosphere. It's about letting people choose and also having a kitchen, which back 30 years ago is quite a rare thing, which was open all the time. So people could go in at four o'clock in the afternoon and have a steak frite, or they could have something at midnight or 2 a.m. in the morning, or they could have breakfast in the morning. So it was... And now, thankfully, there's lots of places like that. Totally. Can I ask, how has the experiential consumer changed life? And what I mean by that is the Instagram generation, the vanity that is so inherent within everyone, the photo needs. Has that changed yeah. your approach? Well, not really. I, I, I mean, I think, first of all, the customer is always incredibly smart. You know, they know what's good. They know what's bad. You can never, ever fool you know uh, any any customer you know uh, when you when you actually see so instagram might blow something up quicker but actually the customer if it's not um good and it's not consistent they won't come back and they will tell people they're not going to come back and they will the the best way to have a successful restaurant cafe private members club is to try and make it good no, I, I totally agree. I, I, and word of mouth is everything. I, I wanted to touch on a couple of points where I think, you know, you've just absolutely nailed it so well. And then we'll, we'll kind of touch on some points that you think you've nailed it on. I, I, for me, the most striking really is also brand. Uh, again, the brands that you've built are iconic. How do you think about brand today? And what does brand really mean to you? Because it's thrown around as a word a lot. But few people, I think, actually understand it. What does brand well, mean to you? I don't really like the word brand. I I I I like to think that it's what we're doing at Soho House and and ultimately the MCG is just a way of living. Really, it's a, it's a, you know it's just you know we tapped into a, a, a situation that people like living in that certain sort of way. And I, I I think when you look at it, there's a lot of people who want to live in that certain sort of way and. It doesn't matter if it's in the UK or it's in North America. And as we're finding, as we grow globally, that way of living is very, you know, appealing in Rome or Paris. And so I know people call it a brand and I know um, so a house, they call it as a brand. But I, I feel it is, a, is it really is a home away from home. And we care deeply and we care deeply about our member. I, I totally get you, and I like that. It's a way of living. Um, my question that I always have, I know I'm, I'm being kind of difficult here, but, you know, given that you don't like the term brand, but it is a brand in some respects. Yeah, and sure. it's a And it's a luxury brand as a private member's yeah. club as well and in others. My challenge is always, how do you retain exclusivity luxury with scale? Now we're in many cities around the world. We have so many locations. Well, yeah, I, I, that, that's a good question. And it's a question that people have been asking me ever since I went from one to two to two to three. And the way that I, I answer that is 
what our member loves is more houses. They love it. You know, when I say to you, Harry, we're opening in Paris, you don't look at me and go, why the hell do you do that? That's just suddenly taken the shine off what I thought it was. You know, we, we're going into cities where we are attracting the most interesting, um, interesting, decent, kind people with a creative soul in these cities. And so as we, as we grow, we're growing that membership globally, which just adds everything for an existing member. So an existing member doesn't go, oh, you're opening nine new houses this year, or you're opening, you, you're going to have up to be 85 houses in the next three years. They go, this is fantastic because, you know, when we eventually get into Africa, when we properly get into Asia, when we open in Mexico City, when we open in, in Sao Paulo, you as a member, we keep adding value to your membership because you're having a home away from home in many cities around the world. You mentioned moving from one to two, three to four, four to five, 10 to 20. What, when you reflect, what was the hardest stage of expansion? Oh, uh, opening in New York. There was no Why? doubt. Um, Why so? Because it was, it was incredibly challenging because, you know, I was, you know, I, I, was, I had to raise money to do it. Um, it was at a time when, you know, banks weren't lending money. It was going into a city which didn't really understand, well, they did understand it, but they didn't acknowledge what a private members club was. They thought, you know, they, they, that, that was not something of, <clears throat> you know, interest to them. They, they, so going into New York and trying to get it built, trying to get it open, you know, that, that really nearly took us down. Can I ask, in terms of like the city selection, how do you think about city selection in terms of what comes next? I'm too fascinated. You said about Asia, you said about Africa, you said about, you know, Mexico City. How does that prioritization list on expansion look? Well, you know, I talked about 85 cities that we will be in in the next three to four years. And but at the moment, we already have a presence in all those cities through our membership CWH, which is basically, as it says on the tin, cities without houses. So within those 85 cities, we already have membership. We already have membership events. We have membership representation in all of those cities. And what happens in those cities is the, the member then finds, the, your, your CWH member then finds you the perfect house. They then hook you up with the local developer. They hook you up with all the things that you need to make that house work. So, and also we can tell by CWH how how popular or how what need there is for a house in that city by how many CWH members there are. I think one of the things I love so much is also the storytelling that comes with a lot of it. Um, well, I think entrepreneurs stay, you mentioned kind of raising money, a lot of raising money is storytelling. Um, I think entrepreneurs stay are actually pretty shit at storytelling, sadly. Um, <laughs> How do you think about storytelling today and what makes great storytelling for you? Well, I think great storytelling is simplicity. And I think, I think anything in life, and I, and I think that's one advantage I have from being dyslexic, is, is the fact that I have to simplify everything. Otherwise, I get very confused and I get in a bit of a panic. So to me, simplification, whether it's in design or whether it's food on a plate or whether it's in a, a tech stack or whether it's in anything we do, needs to be incredibly simple. And I think when you keep your story simple, people do understand it. And I think if you make it overcomplicated and you add too many layers, then people get very confused. Can I ask you, I, I'm, uh, I'm an investor, obviously, too. You know, we manage about half a billion dollars now. Um, I can't really count. I hate spreadsheets. Um, and it makes me desperately insecure because I'm an investor who can't yeah. count. Did you have insecurities given the dyslexia and given that, but also needing to be a business leader and a CEO with you know, big financing rounds and everything that comes with it? Yes, um... Yeah, I, I I learn every day. You know, I I keep learning. I think that's one of the exciting things of running a company. I think if I sat here and said, "Well, I know everything, and I'm going to do it that way," I'm constantly learning. Um, and I 
I, I really f- find it fascinating to learn. And I'm, 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 I sort of do understand the figures, but it took me time to understand them. And it took me time to get you when I go back to over the top. You know, I had to do the accounts myself. So, you know, it's from a very early stage. It, it, in our business, I had to do every bit of it. So you learn every single aspect to it. But as we got bigger now, I'm, I'm blessed by the fact that we have a fantastic leadership team who are incredibly talented and a lot more able than I am in all these areas. You mentioned leadership teams there. How would you describe your style of leadership? And I guess, how has it changed over the years? Go back to 92, you know, Café Boheme, and then today, 2022. How do you describe it today and how's it changed? I I think my leadership style is constantly evolving. Um, You know, I think probably back in 1992, you know, I was, I was very different from now. And you know, I've 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 learned hard to work how to get how to how to be the most influential I can be in my in in the position, you know, of the company, and so it keeps evolving. Um, yeah, I am very challenging. You know, I'm demanding. Um, you know, I, I I don't want to say I'm you know I'm 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 Mr. Nice Guy all the time because you know you 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 can't be when you're you, you when you're when when you're ex- you're running a day-to-day business, which is running 24 hours a day, seven days a week globally. Um, but I, f- I find now I, 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 you know, motivation and be, be motivational is the biggest, biggest help I have in running the company. But at the same time, I'm very challenging on people. When you say about being challenging, I, I think about performance. If I say the words high performance, what does high performance mean to you? What does high performance mean to me? I would, you know, we got lots of brilliant people who work for for the MCG. You know, I I I I I, I get far too many sort of people thinking it's me. It's not. You know, I'm just one very very small click clog in a very big big team of people and. You know, high performance to me is 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 people with passion, who care, who care about people, um, who care about the product. And I think if you get all those P's sorted out, then the fourth P, which is profit, comes. I, I'm totally with you. I just suck at hiring, Nick. Um, I've had many different businesses. I've had many team members, employees, and I just across the board suck. Uh, you have a great leadership team. You've built great teams. Can you help me? What's like some of your biggest lessons, advice on oh, hiring? I, 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 I haven't always got it right on hiring. Uh, I think, you know, interviews are, are really difficult. You know, it's just a play act, isn't it? And, yeah. and actually, you never really find out until someone joins you um I, I, we, we do a lot of internal promotion and i think you know that that helps us a lot that we're always constantly you know people come into our business as a server you know if they want to be it's not long before they're a junior manager and it's not long after that that they can be actually running a site or moving into numerous sites globally so i i i think it's a mixture of Promote, promoting within and then bringing in people from the outside and, 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 and just being honest with people when you interview them. You know, just tell them that, you know, you think you're joining this, this, this place which is all shiny and perfect, but actually, you know, it's hard work to make this work. I think one thing I find very challenging is how do you bring in external talent without disincentivizing or demotivating existing talent who did think that it was a role that they could have? That's one thing I always struggle on. How do you think about that one? Well, I I think if you do that, I think it's it's because you really don't think you you'd much rather I much rather would promote within. So if you end up having to go to the outside to bring in rather than promote within it means that the person isn't right but it doesn't mean they're not always right so I think again if you're clear and honest to the person who hasn't got the job and the reasons why they're not getting the job then that is all right I, I agree with you I think I think um 
I am my, my thing is I'm conflict avoidant. Um, and so I never like to say the hard truths, honestly. <laughs> um, how do you have hard conversations, Nick? I think people do respect you just being, you know, if, if just to tell you how it is. And I think I've learned over the years of what I'm doing that I can do that without, without it being, you know, something I, I try and avoid. So I think you can get to A to B much quicker by just being a bit upfront and a bit honest rather than, than not saying a word. Are there any other hiring mistakes that you've made that you think, ah, that was a big lesson. I wish I'd known I, that. I, I think over the years there's been numerous hiring mistakes. And, and or, you know, and, and that's not just down to me making a mistake. It's, 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 it's you know, it's, it's, it's a, a number of reasons why something doesn't work if someone joins you. And, and, and it, it's actually more likely to be our mistake because, you know, people come into the business and they go, God, this is not quite what I was expecting, or it's a bit harder work than I was expecting, or this or that. So I think what you have to be when you're hiring people is very, very clear. You know, you just go through, right, here are all the reasons why you might not want to join us, and listen. And, you know, and then if you're honest like that, they can go, okay, well, at least, at least they told me. I, listen, I, I totally agree with you in terms of the honesty there. You said about the challenging nature that you know you have with the team and you like to push. Are you challenging on yourself? Do you ever give yourself a break, Nick? I know you love it. I love what I do. But I put myself under a fuckload of pressure. <laughs> I'm sure you do too. Yeah, I, 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 I often don't get it right, Harry. I often, you know, make, make mistakes. And... I think the one thing I've I've learned is that when you do make a mistake, is put your hand up, admit it, admit it to the team. You know, don't try and think you're always getting it right. And and I think people really respect that, and they they go, you know, he's you know the, he's human, and he's admitting that he's wrong because um, I am often wrong, and I make decisions which are not always right. And I think the key is when you make a bad decision is. Put your hand up. Say, "Look, I'm sorry. I made a bad decision, and let's change track now." Rather than being, "I'm so I made that decision. I don't want to prove to I want to prove to everyone it's the right decision when it, clearly it's the wrong decision." So, you know, it's a it's a something I'm always learning. But that that's down to you as a leader, which is you have to create an environment of safety where someone can feel secure enough to say, "Nick, I fucked up. It's my bad," um, and here's the resolution pathway and not many people feel safe enough in their roles where they can say i fucked up and try and hide it because they're too scared how do you think about creating safety and acceptance of failure and risk within your leadership team without repercussions of you're fired or serious repercussions well it's, it's, it's a good point because people don't you know when they're in a job they don't want to if they make a mistake or they, they, they don't want to necessarily put their hand up and say it was my fault or whatever. But actually, the weird thing from my point of view, that just gains a lot more respect for me, you know, because yeah. is, is, is acknowledgement and moving on is really important. And so we do, I talk about it a lot. I talk about, you know, the, 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 the safety they have just to just own up to the, any problems which 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 might have happened or or mistakes they might have made, um, but it's a, it's always work in progress. Yeah, no, I, I'm totally with you. I mean, speaking of uh, work in progress, I do just want to touch on parenting before a quick fire round. It's obviously a core cool part of uh, your life and, and and many incredible entrepreneurs' lives. When you think about parenting and fatherhood. What have been some of your biggest lessons in terms of what great fatherhood means to you? Well, what great fatherhood means to me. Um, I've got four children. Um, you know, I'm very lucky. But, um, you know, I have a, I get on with them all very well. I, I love being in their company. I think they like being in my company. Um, I think I have a super smart wife and a brilliant mother, which makes up a lot from for my 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 probably my lack of um, direct parenting, and I think when 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 I'm at home, you know, I and I've come home from 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 running running 
running the business day to day. I, I, I sort of want to just sort of go into a slightly different mode. I, I want to be less challenging. And so, you know, but I, I, I think from my, my children's point of view is, is, you know, learn to be decent and kind and, and, and get on with people and, and learn to go out and work and, 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 you know, that seems to have worked so far. Can I ask, I, I love children, but I'm terrified that bluntly when you have kids, you know, we, I work fucking hard. Like you, you cannot have children and be a great father without losing an inch on performance. That terrifies me. Um, and my Italian girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> so my question to you is like, how do you retain that brilliant executor without losing an inch on performance? but also be present as a husband and a father? Well, or I actually, think, is it an acceptance? I think a, a, you know, balance is always a tricky thing, especially when you are, you know, workaholic, entrepreneur, you know, you, you it is a, you know, just getting a balance. I, I think acknowledging being a workaholic, and I think, you know, people, I, I think, and, and I think this is really important for people, is, is, is that people often sort of um sort of praise people who work incredibly hard but actually what they should be doing is saying well surely you should be getting a bit more balance in your life because that's a lot more healthy and and I think you know what you've got to learn Harry I think is a balance and you've got to be able to learn a time to slow down and and, and enjoy family because you know that to me is 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 much more important do you have balance, Nick? I'm learning it every day, and <laughs> and and and, and uh, you know, I I I I, I wish at times I had better balance on 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 between the two, but I, you know, it's, 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 I'm always learning it. Do you think there's any misconceptions that people have about you, media, um, and people generally build ideas about you know more well-known figures? Um, do you think people have misconceptions about you that you don't think are true or that you think are maybe different? Um, I'm sure. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I am, I've, I've got a lot of people who work for me and all been my partners for a very, very long time. So, you know, I'd like to think that they would, would they would point out anything that I needed to, 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 to change or swap around. Um, but, you know, everyone's, very much entitled to their opinion and I and I usually and I love meeting people so you know and I always make time for anyone who does want to meet me final one for the quick fire do you find tough feedback hard to take like for me if someone doesn't like a show or doesn't like something I do I, I take it very personally do you when you get feedback on a location that's not great or negative even how how do you ingest it without getting hurt well I, I think first of all feedback that we get from our members comes from a place of they care so it's really important for me you know to put that in context and not get upset you know I'm passionate so yes you 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 when you're not getting it right you get upset but you don't get upset at the actual feedback you get upset that maybe they got a point and you got it wrong so you know I I, I encourage as honest and brutal feedback as possible. Yeah, no, listen, I, I totally agree. I'm just learning to not get very offended and hurt. <laughs> well, <laughs> and you know, in the dark room. I, I, I think, you know, it, it, you'd always, because you care, and I care, so it's always going to slightly hurt. Right, we're going to do a quick fire round. So I say a short statement, Nick, and then you give me your immediate thoughts in 60 seconds or less per one, okay? Okay. So let's start with what was what is the hardest element today of your role? I, I've is is keeping the team motivated and and happy and thinking that they they've they've got a really successful future. What changes when you go public? What changes when you have to be a public market CEO? I think you're a lot more exposed. Um, you know, you, 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 your, your team, you know, are under more pressure and, but at the same time, I think it's good. I think it's, I, I think being a public CEO is, you know, a happy investor and a happy member go hand in hand. 
tell me, what would you most like to change about the hospitality world today? I'd love everyone to realise that it's such a brilliant industry to go into. And I think the perception is that it's still not. And I think, you know, I think going into hospitality, you learn skills that you keep for the whole of your life, whether it's, you know, meeting people and getting on with different people you wouldn't ever otherwise be in contact with, learning how to make a cocktail, making a bed, learning how to pick up a load of plates and clearing a table. These are skills you can have whatever you go off and do in life. So I just wish everyone in their in their mind for I've always got to do two years as a as a bartender or a server. What would you most like your children to adopt if there were three traits that you could choose? I think kind, kindness, decency, um, and and a, a decent ethic of work. Yeah. Tell me, you have a billboard anywhere in the world with anything on it. Where do you choose to have it and what do you have on the billboard? Um, I think it's the billboard I, board I look at most, which is on Sunset um, from mm -hmm. Soho House, West Hollywood. Um, it's on the side of 9,000. So that would be the billboard I'd have. Um, what would I have on it? Um, I would have on it <clears throat> um, something which made everyone smile as they drove past. What's your favourite location? Every location is a favourite location because every <laughs> every every location is 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 much work as the, the last location. Which one's your favourite child? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'd love it if you could tell that one, but not the favourite location. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're, uh, I, they're, I, they're, I, they're all my favourite children. I, I, I am joking, don't worry. Uh, final one for you. Tell me, the next 10 years for you and for Soho House, it's 2032, and we have another conversation. Where do you want Soho House to be then? I'd like it to be properly global. Um, I want it to be a place, an inclusive place, where anyone with a creative soul um, can come and flourish. And that we constantly are looking in every part of the community to 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 help people not just socially but also at work and professionally to to flourish nick this has been such a joy for me to do as i said uh, huge huge admirer of yours for a long time so i jumped to the chance when dusty suggested this but thank you so much for joining me today well thank you very much for having me on i'm 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 i was honored with the invite so thank you harry <laughs>